This shows you how, they're, how they, the difference in the content of each note compared to all the other patents in the whole set. And then you can also just identify communities and color each one of those nodes by the communities that are detected by the algorithm. And so we did all those things. And um, what you see when you put it together is here's a bunch of, a handful of patents that we've looked at, never looked at many, many more, of course. And in principle, we're doing this for all the patents. You can color them globally, color them locally, or color them by community. And you see some differences here. Um, and what I want to point out is first of all, let's look at the global coloring up here. Notice these two patents overall have the same color, the same green. And if you think about the cons, the technology, they're pretty similar. And other ones which are quite different, stents have very different colors. So the final thing I want to say is that this reach calculation I was talking about, it's essentially the diversity of color in one of these genealogies. And this is a high, a high diversity of color. And these have some diversity, not that much, and these are pretty uniform. And uh, of course, there are various caveats uh, that I should mention, such as this global PCA is not really global. It's only made over a subset of 30 patents, and it's not a random subset, so it's skewed. Um, and there are other things that uh, I should say, like we can quantify these things. So the thing to take home from this is, I want to suggest there's a non-biological paradigm of open-ended evolution, and we should be open to this kind of thing. And you can operationalize and observe at least things like reach, and that's just the first thing you looked at. It's, it's easy to think of how to quantify other things. Um, I showed you some preliminary reach results. I wanted to suggest that these are plausible. Um, and of course, there's other work to be done, such as neutral models that we've heard talk about in the past. Thank you. Time for one very quick question whilst the next speaker gets set up. Hiroki? Yeah, a very interesting work. So have you looked at the distribution of the semantic content in the 200 dimensional space over time? Are they penetrating into the underexplored area over time? Yeah, that's, uh, that's ongoing work. And um, part of the, so if you look at, if you, if you have a very coarse resolution in the very beginning, everything is represented, but some are more worked than others. But you have a more fine-grained resolution. What we're hoping for and what we're looking for right now is a way to see when there are regions of this trade space that are unexplored and unoccupied and then become occupied. Because that would be the opening of a new region. And so the technology is all set up to do this, but you know, these results I'm showing you were produced like last night. And so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Our next speaker, Sudden Hickman. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, my talk's always overrun, so luckily I'm going to squeeze a five minute talk into eight minutes. <laughs> um, I'm going to hopefully talk for one minute in my eight minutes about each of these things. I'm going to give you a motivation for a new measure of evolutionary activity, talk about how it's designed, and I'm basically going to advertise a couple of talks I'm giving later in the main conference uh, in two applications, and then I'm going to give you some misspelled conclusions. Uh, so, motivation. Uh, who knows about Willie Blair? Just lol. Yeah? Okay. Don't need to stand it too much. Basically, this guy Tom Dixon and his company Blantech trying to basically shove things into his blender uh, to see if they will actually blend into powder. It's a particularly interesting one if you've got access to YouTube right now. Please do have a look where he tries to blend a, a Nexus, a Kindle, and an iPad. And he's asking this question: Will it blend of these three things? Um, the reason I raise this and the reason I title this is that measuring activity in the systems that we work on is rather like blending consumer electronics. You're basically taking a complex system, you're mashing it to pieces, destroying all of the interesting stuff, and then asking a yes, no question of the powder that remains. I think that's kind of true, okay? And in the example I just showed, the slide I just showed, they were comparing three systems, three complex systems. They got a comparison, the answer was that they're all blending. But the comparison isn't really telling us the things we want to know. We, we want to know if the system's open-ended, or how much how open-ended it is by some sort of way. So our, our question is, need this be the case? Can we not develop a measure which actually is telling us something useful? And we've seen some interesting ideas this morning about how that might work. And the other question is, of course, is this an area we should be working on? I'm hoping to persuade you that the answer is yes. Okay. And there are two reasons why I think we should try and measure things. They've been touched on by other speakers as well. Um, I work on simulate, simulated systems, artificial chemistries. Um, and there's a difference between our artificial chemistries and real chemistries that is purely practical. Chemists can make 
their chemicals do really interesting things, and they can say what the interesting things are. Very often, they can't tell you how it arrived at that result. In software systems, we have the opposite. <coughs> we can have absolute knowledge of what our software system is doing, or our artificial chemistry is doing. But we end up with a mountain of data, and we have to probe that data to try and figure out what's going on. Particularly so, as we have now got more processing power than, than we know what to do with, and we can run large-scale simulations with lots of data. So I think an evolutionary activity measure, with a long-term goal of measuring <coughs> activity, and evolutionary activity, should help us to detect those things. But the second reason I think is the most important one, and I've got this sort of soapbox idea that we can start from scratch too often in artificial life. We often sort of start on a new project and say, oh, we need a new system, we can't possibly do it, an old system. And that leads to all of these new systems emerging that we aren't really comparing against each other properly. And that's because they're too different to compare properly. I'd like to argue that we're not comparing systems rigorously, and we need to improve systems. And to do that, we need to measure them and see what the activities are on. And all of these arguments actually require a useful measure of evolutionary activity. So I've designed one, hurrah. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to persuade you that it's actually pretty good. Um, and these are the arguments for trying a new one, OK? I've just said we don't need new stuff, and here's a new one. <laughs> so we want a numerical measure. Um, previous measures of evolutionary activity were based on the idea that you would plot a graph of what's going on, and you would interpret that graph to back up your arguments. But the strengths of those previous measures were they were based purely on population data. The great thing about that is they're widely applicable. You can measure lots of systems just on counting the number of species and the population, the sizes of those species and the population. But the drawback is that they don't, they sort of, you need to have a fitness function in order to create the shadow model. And that can be a problem in systems where you don't have an extrinsic fitness function that you can turn off to create the shadow model. So we don't want to distinguish between intrinsic or extrinsic fitness. So here is the measure. Um, because I'm giving two talks later in the week, I'm going to just say this very, very quickly. What we're looking for, this is the population dynamics over a period of time with a bunch of different species emerging. I'm not going to do a show of hands type of thing. But you might want to ask yourself, where is the evolution happening in this system? And I would argue that most of the evolution is happening at <coughs> this point, where this dominant species is replaced by this dominant species. There's nothing in here about hierarchies or there might, you might say there's a little bit of activity going on here because you've got a sub, sub sort of population arising that might be something interacting in some co-evolutionary way with the dominant species. And these are the things that we want to reward with a spike of score. Okay? And the maths over there uh, allows you to do that. And the other good thing is that you can add these spikes together to get a measure of the activity and a whole simulation. A single number that tells you that this simulation has a has created this much evolution. Kind of really low level, will it blend stuff? But it can be useful if you're running lots of simulations because you can see which simulation is doing the interesting thing. So I've run this on two examples. The first example um, I've done on Tierra. The second example is uh, our own string wall system. The Tierra talk is on Wednesday morning. The string wall talk is on Thursday afternoon. Please do come along if you find this interesting. Um, it's quite interesting that Tierra is an emulation of life and not a simulation. And the work I'm going to be talking about on Wednesday on identifying things I'm calling biases in Tierra that influence the evolution of the system on planet waves. Those are the sorts of biases I don't quite identify. But what we did was we ran 100 uh, long term simulations of Tierra, 10 billion time steps, um, in a standard configuration. Then we removed those biases and ran 100 long term simulations with, with those biases removed. And we got this distribution of the evolutionary activity score. And what you can see is that original Tierra does this kind of interesting thing. But de bias Terra, you get this bimodal distribution of evolutionary activity. And the measure allows us to look more closely at what's going on in this area and see if there's actually something interesting going on, which is really useful in these days of high performance computing, big based systems, massive, massive simulations. The other example I'll be presenting on Thursday is to do with string ball. And here we were looking at a topic that I'm quite surprised hasn't been mentioned yet this morning, and that is to do with the conservation of matter. So here we implemented, will someone mind shutting that door, please? <laughs> here we implemented conservation of matter uh, in string ball, uh, 
and try different ways of, look, of, of, of implementing it in our, an artificial chemistry. We fixed the concentrations of all of the upcoats to be the same amount. We uh, evolved different concentrations, and then there's a little surprise at the end that I'll say for the talk. But basically, the measures allowed us to do, ask these questions of a system and change them. And that's kind of important because it means that we've got a way of trying to incrementally improve our A-life systems that previously didn't exist. So please come to those talks. Um, conclusion. We have got a useful measure for comparing systems and improving designs. I think this is really exciting and important. It's useful for finding examples of activity of some sort in large data sets from our simulations. But I want to emphasize, I don't think this should be used in isolation. We need more measures. Open-ended evolution is, of course, multi-objective. And a suite of these measures, I think, is really important. The final thing I want to say, if we get a suite of these measures together, we have the potential to create a meta-revolver for open-ended evolution. And I think that's really exciting. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sam. Steve, did you, um, do you want to get your thing set up? And we can take another question for Simon. Answer. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting when you measure, I was wondering how you can do things like lock and lock tail cycles. Yes, uh, well, there will be population dynamics that are not due to evolution that yeah. this measure will detect. But I think the thing is that if you're running on lots of simulations with lots of sweeps, then on average you will detect things that are actually doing more evolution than things that are just doing population dynamics because the, the way the population jitters will be much more when evolution is achieved. But that's to be argued. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. To, uh, to extract some lessons from the bottom-up construction of minimal life we've been uh, trying for a few years. And uh, I'll sort of make the conclusions right up front. Uh, as many of you have already pointed out, the larger systems, more dimensions, higher object complexity or diversity enables higher order functionalities to, to come about from uh, uh, a richer set of information interaction, so when we talk about information channels, we think about a simulation system. And that's necessary for open evolution. But as we all know, it's not so easy, even though this is a necessary condition, I don't know what a sufficient condition is, because as you add complexity, you can easily uh, end up messing up the system. So how do I get So I don't have time to go through the, uh, the whole core cell design, but we for many years, more than 10, almost 12 years, been working on implementing a self-reproducing molecular machine in, in the lab. And um, it's pretty clear that, uh, that we need to both have uh, self-organizing parts, we need to pump it, everybody agrees on that. And also we need to have self-assembly in there. Um, and it turns out that we can, um, we can set up a system where metabolism takes in energy, free energy and resources and then produces uh, container components and information components and then there is an intricate uh, interplay with these guys and then you uh, should in principle be able to get a self-producing machine. We have still not gotten uh, the production of this guy to happen without genetic, uh, uh, without the uh, instrument <coughs> help, so, um, so it's not fully uh, autonomous yet. But one thing that's clear from studying this system and, and Actually, it's true for all the systems I'm aware of. There are none of these designs that enable uh, these minimal living systems to evolve open ended. Our system has this ability, even though we haven't shown, since we can't get these guys to replicate, we haven't been able to demonstrate this experimentally. But if it works, it certainly works in simulation, we will have a higher catalytic production of uh, both its own. Um, components as well as the container components. So we won't have a open-ended evolution apparently in this system. And I'm not sure, so we've been here for many years, of course we've tried to get the system to work, but of course we've all thought about how could we actually make it be, uh, be more interesting, how can we explore more things uh, in an evolutionary sense. So I'll just take a step back. Um, 
we sort of uh, we stumbled upon a um, uh, problem. How do you? It's a sort of related problem. How can you get a high order emergence? How can you get structures that assemble into uh, to larger structures that then assemble into larger structures? So through the interactions, you get more. Uh, you get higher order uh, interactions. Uh, also, sorry, functionalities. And I'll just give you a simple example. If you have, if you have a, some of you have heard this many times, but I still think this is how I, I get intuition about it. If you have monomers that potentially can be put together to polymers, if you look at them by themselves, um, then you cannot observe elasticity or permeability uh, if you have these individual objects. However, if you put them together, some of these objects together, even if there's no elasticity in the bond between them, then if you have this second order the object that composed of the monomers, this polymer, you can actually measure, you can observe elasticity simply because there are many more uh, folded states than there are stretch states in, if you put it in a, in a suspension. If you then have two different kinds of, um, of objects, so some, one of them likes water more than the other one, then you can form uh, vesicles, you can form micelles, and then suddenly you have a third order structure um, which where, where you can actually measure and observe permeability, you can observe an inside, you can observe an, an, an outside, and you can add on um, object after object or component after component, and then you'll be able to observe uh, more and more um, functionalities. Now, you can make this precise um, by simulating it, and I'll just give a few examples. So these stars means that there. This is this is the data structure in simulation where you. It's a discrete simulation where you simulate this, uh, this, this system. Uh, this this data structure means uh, the stars means that it's empty. This means there's something. So if you have a lattice gas, some of you may be familiar with that. You only need to know that there is a uh, whether there is a pro whether there is a particle at a lattice point or not, and, and also which direction it's going. If you want to have an excluded volume. You need to have more information, so you need to have you need to add in your data structure. And as you go up and let's see, if you want to have this, just give you another example. So if you want to have two two guys to bind to each other, if you want to have a polymer bond, uh, then you need to. If I am a uh, one monomer, you another monomer, then I need to tell you where I am, and I need to know where you are. So you need to have more information. And I don't want to go through all the details, but the bottom line is, as you add uh, more and more uh, object complexity, you can capture more and more of these complex structures you need to actually make such a protocell. And we, we've, we've done that in, in simulation. So, so you sort of make a, uh, so uh, you have a, a combinatorial explosion and interactions that result from adding new objects or adding object complexity. We could, we could do some of the same by adding, uh, uh, by adding dimensions and, and doing other things, but this is what we do. So, so having, um, having learned that lesson, one could say, well, why don't we then just add more here or add more here? So it means more energy transduction components, mean different metabolic processes, mean different building blocks, and if you have more lipid or information building blocks, um, for instance, you can make different containers, and you can make different information molecules, and you should be able to make uh, higher order structures. However, as if any of you are chemists, then you'll know that if you just you don't need to add very much together because before it turns into a black top. So it's very, very important that you add with care and you add the right things in the right order. And that leads me to the conclusion here that, again, um, more complexity in one way or the other of the system we're looking at seems to be necessary for opening the evolution, but uh, it's not sufficient. And um, yeah, so and, and, and in which order, both which kind and which order you add components is not arbitrary. So then you can start asking, uh, well, is it is it this uh, good component inclusion ability a property developed by the living system, or is it a property of the fitness landscape and there are people that, that has been uh, promoting those perspectives? And I don't know. Um, so, so I guess, uh, so I'm asking, are we left with, uh, uh, with trial and error? I mean, can we say anything more about this sufficient? I mean, we all know, it seems like there's consensus that we need to have more complex uh, spaces. 
So that was my five cents. Thank you. Uh, we have some time for a question. Yes. Uh, I wonder if your conclusion, Steve, uh, put you on one side of the metabolism first versus genome first debate. What? You know, in the origin of life, some people say it was metabolism first, some argue that the genome came first. Of course, it's, you cannot have, you have, it has to be metabolism because without <laughs> energy, <laughs> not, nothing moves without energy. It's ridiculous to think that you can do, you can do anything without energy. But then there's no control. That's <coughs> there's no what? There's no, you, your, your final paragraph saying you need some means of controlling what comes in first. That's why I was asking the question. No, no, but see, see, there is, but, but okay, it's of course much more complicated than that. But you need to you have a driver, you need to have a driver uh, that that before you can you can actually have, develop some what we need to view as, as information and what can be a model. Another question? Sorry, we have time. Yeah. Uh, do you have a question about your uh, the necessary condition up there? Yeah. Um, if in order to get more and more kinds of evolution or higher and higher complexity, you have to make the elementary objects more and more complex. That's, somehow that seems, that's, that doesn't seem like how it happened in reality. You know, I assume not? that you started, I mean, it, you know, can you sit, talk a bit about this? Can yeah, you see why it doesn't seem like it happened that way? You know, you have physics and chemistry, you have it, it's just fixed forever. But no, but you start out. Well, what we're doing here, we're starting at the bottom. So, so you you know that the atoms they're made out of a certain number of protons and neutrons, and uh, a corresponding number of electrons. And I think we can't we can't do much with hydrogen. You need to add more both neutrons and protons and electrons. But of course, the question is, is it is it necessary? I think several of you have already mentioned mentioned is it necessary to have an infinitely large system to have open-ended evolution or or, uh, or can we sort of, or, become, or does, it, does the system become large enough so we can't, it, it, it's sort of uh, open-ended for us if we just reach a certain level. But I, I don't know, it's a good question. I, I don't know. Thanks very much. We'll continue that at lunch. Uh, Emily, Dawson. Yeah, hi, Steve. Um, I have a question about the uh, genome talking about understanding complexity barriers and evolving systems. Uh, and don't worry, I'm going to explain in a moment what complexity barriers are. Uh, so we've been talking a lot today about different ways that we can measure and define open-endedness. Um, but I think very informally at a high level, we can all agree that we want it to mean a system keeps doing interesting things. So in order to use that, first we have to define keep doing. Um, and there's a fair amount of consensus that we can measure some quantity about a system uh, and see if it appears to uh, exhibit unbounded rather than asymptotically bounded growth. So for instance, here my co-author, Mike Weiser, was studying fitness uh, in a group of E. coli that had been evolving for over 60,000 generations now. Uh, and so early in the experiment, they had this data and they wanted to know whether the fitness was going to follow the blue unbounded line or the red asymptotically bounded line. Um, and statistically, it seemed to be a better fit for the blue line. Uh, upon further evolution, it turned out that that was correct. Um, these do indeed appear to be growing in fitness unboundedly. Um, but so fitness is kind of a messy term. Uh, since we have computational systems, we can do better um, in our term in terms of how to define interesting things. Um, and so what we're thinking is that it might actually be useful to kind of flip the question around. And instead of trying to think about this really giant nebulous concept of open-endedness, instead think about what kind of barriers stop a system from exhibiting open um, and then we can specifically ask questions about what leads to being able to overcome specific barriers um, and do much more rigorous hypothesis testing regarding how to build systems that exhibit specific dynamics. Uh, so I'm going to talk about four dynamics that we, or four barriers that we have come up with. Um, we're definitely interested if people have thoughts on other barriers that systems might encounter. Uh, I'm going to talk about also a way we've come up with for measuring these. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to take a brief detour. Uh, and talk about that. Um, so this example is in Avita, which is the system that we've been using for our tests, but it should generalize to any system with a dynamic genome. So these could just as easily be nucleotides and DNA. 
Um, so basically what we want to do is we want to be looking at units that actually demonstrate meaningful variation as opposed to neutral variation. Um, so we want to kind of knock out all of the neutral variation. So we're going to build a skeleton of the genome that actually contains what we care about. Um, so let's say we have this example of genome. It has a bit of three. So we can sequentially knock out the instructions. So we knock out the first one, still it's a bit of three. Okay, so that instruction didn't contain any information. We don't include it in the skeleton. We knock out the second instruction, turns out that that is legal to lose. Um, so clearly it contains information, we include it in the skeleton. We continue doing this, um, and there are complexities to this, which I'm happy to talk about offline, but eventually we end up with a skeleton that only contains the informative sites of the genome. Um, and so this is the unit I'm going to be using going forward. So the first barrier that we might encounter in a system um, to increasing in the interestingness of the thing that it's doing is change. Um, and we see this all the time with genetic algorithms. Fitness plateaus over time, as you see in the graph on the far side. Um, and that's because the population converges on whatever the best solution it can find is. Um, and it's trivial to avoid this. All you need is some kind of oscillation or maybe rock, paper, scissors dynamics. But interestingly, when we were first talking to biologists about ninja evolution, this is what they assumed we meant. Um, so, as I just implied, just changing isn't necessarily that interesting. We want to see new things. Um, so that brings us to novelty, which is a topic we've discussed a lot today. Um, and it's clearly important if we want to continue to see interesting things, they have to be new. Um, so, for instance, novelty search should very clearly um, achieve this. Uh, right. So I forgot to mention, the way to measure change is to look at whether or not the skeletons that are in the population at a given time change for novelty. It is, do we see new, uh, new skeletons that we've never seen before continuously appearing in the population? Um, so that's all well and good, um, but uh, as Lemon and Stanley showed in this paper, uh, if you take one of the exterior walls off the maze in which this paper does, or in which this algorithm does so well, suddenly searching just for novelty will get you all locations outside of the maze that you don't actually care about. So not all novelty is actually interesting. Uh, and so in order to find signatures of actually interesting dynamics beyond this, um, we have two potential barriers that systems can run into. The first one is that things stop increasing in complexity. So if we want to figure out if a system has complexity potential, then we want to see if the most complex thing in the population is more complex over time. So with our skeleton representation, that's really easy because each element in the skeleton is basically a piece of information. So we can see if the skeletons get longer over time. Um, this is something that you know, we observed in biology originally. Things were a single cell that was the most complex, and then we had cellular organisms being the most complex. So it's not unreasonable to expect that this would exist um, in a computational system. Um, but another really interesting thing that we see in biology is ecosystems. Um, in ecosystems, it's really cool that Creating a new thing opens up a bunch of new niches for entirely new things. So when this sloth evolved, suddenly there was a niche for symbiotic algae to live on it. Of course, the sloth couldn't have evolved in the first place if it hadn't been for the rest of the rainforest that it lives in. Um, and so this system of diversity getting diversity is really a powerful feedback that we think could be really important to achieving open and evolution. Uh, and this, again, is something we've seen in biology. Um, this 2015 paper shows uh, ecological niches basically over time um, in the fossil record. Uh, as you can see, they're continuing to increase. So we think this is reasonable to achieve. Um, so just to put these all in perspective, uh, to have novelty potential, you clearly have to have change potential because uh, if you're seeing new things, then your population is changing. Complexity potential and ecological potential both also require novelty potential because uh, if you're seeing more complex things, then clearly you're seeing new things and you're seeing a greater diversity of skeletons in the population, uh, which is how we measure ecological potential, then clearly some of them must be new. Uh, but the relationship between complexity and ecological potential is much less clear. We suspect that they very much facilitate each other, uh, but that probably requires empirical testing to untangle. Uh, lastly, we think that it's probably useful to include a major transition type potential somewhere in here, um, but that's a lot more challenging to measure, and so we're definitely open to thoughts on how to do that. Um, so I'd like to thank my co-authors, Anya Bastinar, Mike Weiser, and our advisor, Charles Nefria. Um, funding sources, we the NSF, and I serve our computational resources. Thank you. So, uh, I hope you may have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes? 
Uh, so when you were doing the, the linear knockouts, did you try any uh, multiple knockouts? Did you see crossover effects? Yeah, um, so we also test for two position knockouts, and that definitely can have an effect. Um, sometimes there are two things that are canceling each other out. So if removing both of them uh, has no effect, then we remove both of them. Any other questions? Yes. What about the environment? How do we vary the environment? Right, so um, we think environment is a really important factor that will lead to a system behaving differently on these metrics. Uh, so we've been running some really preliminary tests. Um, the data isn't all back yet. It's like currently running. Um, but yeah, we've been looking at an environment um, where basically the only way to achieve higher fitness is to self-replicate. Uh, and then one where you can do more complex logic tasks. And then another even more complex one where there's density dependence. Um, and we're hoping we'll see different results with those. I think that's time for the final question. Yes. So I was wondering if the, the, it's the possible for uh, the new framework to include the historical view to characterize those things. Because you know, if you measure diversity or the complexity, it's just one shot measurement in current configuration, right? But the novelty has to be defined in, in view of what happened in the past. Right, as this change. Um, so the way that we're evaluating all this is we're Loading in, you know, everything that has ever existed in the population. Oh, so you are including the old Yeah, so this is like we do each of these measurements for every 10,000 generations. Okay, thank you very much.
then you can see uh, very old tiles like a lounge and a kitchen, and then new tiles is associated with this one. So it's a co occurrence so, so, so basic tiles with uh, with uh, new tiles. And you can see some of them has a bunch of you know a farm out of that, and then some of them are not. So there is some sort of a effect. Effect uh, one, one of the important attacks uh, having more um, tags to associate with. So this is reminds me of a fusion I called. I published uh, the paper with Kuni uh, already 25 years ago. Is that uh, when one, one of the strain uh, emerges, we call it modular sequences. And once this one appears, then it can combine them with other tag, other sequences to you know accelerate the evolution. So the evolution is not just you know constantly increasing, but it's like a pancake. So it's going up, then new times that emerges, it is going up. So this is one of the characteristics of also happening in this web service. So now again uh, we try to look at the phylogeny from a uh, photo tag. Photos. So each node is now its photo. Right. And some of them are the uh, clear phylogeny, but as Mark described, there's no uh, direct reproductions. So because it's also all, always mediated by the human. So uh, this is looks like you know uh, this is parents and this is a child, but it's not. Right? It's mediated all by the uh, humans. Still, there is a phylogeny emerges in this photo, which I think is interesting. Like you, if you know about spin glasses, this metastable state has a, a interesting phylogeny from one to the other. So there's a uh, memory and history thing is done. So like this one, right? So one of them has a long story, but some of them has a, a big fund, and then it's, it's converging, right? So convergence, and this one is also some uh, maybe more. This is like a price equation that you can see, like uh, how the, um, the, the competition between the different uh, uh, different phylogenies, and also each unit of the phylogeny is mutating into a different ones. So there's a uh, two additional types, but the interesting point is how to introduce open-endedness into the price equations. And then this one has already this one. So we try to measure as